Welcome back to Building Better Businesses in ABA with me, Jonathan Mueller. It's a weekly podcast about the forces reshaping our autism services field. Learn from successful entrepreneurs, payers, investors, and leaders in applied behavior analysis. Thank you, kind listener, for letting me into your world today. Now on to the show. My guest today is Danny Combs. Danny is a fourth generation woodworker and mechanical tinkerer who grew up making stuff with his family. Eventually, he decided to follow his own path and went to Nashville to play music. His vibrant career included various platinum albums with Grammy and Oscar winning recording artists. Danny has two incredible children, Dylan and Ellie. When his son Dylan was diagnosed with autism, Danny formed TACT, teaching the autism community trades to help other kids like his own and their families. He's past board chair president of the Autism Society of Colorado. He's in the Air Force Reserve working in space system operations. And most recently, he co-founded the Colorado Neurodiversity Chamber of Commerce. Danny has a master's degree in education, is a board certified cognitive specialist, a certified autism specialist, and a classic car junkie. Danny, welcome to the pod, dude. Welcome. Thank you. I appreciate it so much. So, Danny, you are literally like a renaissance man. Um, and uh, there's so much that you do that I want to dig into. But, but you're, you know, you're also a consummate entrepreneur. And tell me, when did you realize that you were a visionary builder entrepreneur? Oh, it's very flattering. I don't know if I would necessarily think of myself in all those things. I just, I like learning. I love learning new things. I love to read. I like new experiences. I find that best I can tell, we get one shot at this and there's so much to do. So I find that I'm always looking and enjoying and trying to really take it in. I mean, my life was changed with, with my son. And I mean, I would say for the better, I feel like I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be, but it certainly was in a different direction for sure. But I just find that I have a unique background. My parents were amazing. My family uh, lineage, I feel like I come from good individuals that raised me in a nice way that gives me the tools I need to be the person I need to be for my son. So it, it's kind of neat how it feels like it all comes full circle. So I'm just trying to do the best I can with it. So yeah, appreciate well, it. it. Tell me some more about Dylan, about your son and the, the autism diagnosis. And how did that change yeah. your perspective on the community and, and on your world? That's a great question. It, it changed so much. I mean, I, I feel like when I first heard those words, I didn't know nearly as much as I know now. So, I mean, I definitely had a different perception too, but I mean, it also explained a lot and also brought a lot of like, oh, that makes so much more sense now at at the same time. But at the same token too, I mean, the world's changed so much since he was diagnosed. He's 14 now. He was younger when, you know, we first got those words. I've been in Denver now for a decade. So this was all the way back in Nashville. And it was hard to hear, honestly. Like I would love to tell you that I have this, great response for is this like, yay, and let's go and all that. But I was, I took it hard at first, honestly, selfishly, I had all these thoughts of like, you know, does this change who I am as a man, as a father, as like, will I ever be a grandfather? Is my family name going to carry on? I mean, all these selfish thoughts, but I'm just being real and honest kind of, kind of thoughts. And then, um, you know, I feel like diving in and seeing how amazing he was and all the love and joy that he brought that really felt like something to get behind and uh, trying to support his strengths too because i mean he was six six and a half before he could say like i love you dad or really express in a way that i really received it felt like his affection and my daughter at that point was three and i was having more conversations with her and um It was seeing his strengths and the way that he could do things. That was really the inspiration for TACT and the launching pad that, you know, brought us here to get to meet each other today. So I always credit Dylan with changing my life for the better. I think he's taught me so much and I've learned so much more from him than I think I could ever teach him. And um, I'm really grateful for all of it. So, yeah. Wow. That idea of like, you've learned so much more from him than you could ever teach him. That's such a humbling and you have just this powerful perspective, Danny. Um, and I, I honor your journey. And I'm curious, was there a very direct line from his autism diagnosis to then your sense that, huh, our community needs something, um, you know, and, and, and then forming tact or, you know, what was the need you saw in the community that prompted you to start tact? That's a great question. So, um, 
Yes, there was a, a great group um, down in Nashville, just outside of Nashville. I lived on the old Hickory Lake there. And there was a group called Little Fox Therapy. So if they watch this, they were great at the, out in Mount Juliet, just to the east of Nashville there. And um, they were doing great things. And it was a great team. And I gave them a whole bunch of money because I was paying for everything out of pocket because nothing is covered in Tennessee under any kind of insurance. It's at all, which is part of the catalyst of bringing me to Colorado. And um, during that process, it was just so... He needs to do this. He needs to change that. He needs to do X, Y, and Z. And while yes, they identified, you know, areas of growth in him and helped me discover some success enablers that he needed. I never once heard, and I'm not putting them down at all. So if it doesn't come across like that, but I never heard what he was good at and like what he could do yeah. or the things that, you know, the potential that he did have. And so seeing him able to make things, fix things, visualize things, conceptualize things. It started as simple as that. It was just like, okay, these are things that I can identify that he's really good at. And how do I find a way to build that up and help him see that in himself? Yeah. I've never wanted him to ever feel like this world he needs to change for. I've always wanted it to be, and I hope at you know, the end of my days, wherever Dylan ends up, that he looks at the world and never realizes the struggle that we went through to get that world in place. I want him to just be like, this is who I am. They see me for who I am and they embrace it. I think we got a long way to go for that. But seeing those strengths in him started putting together the idea of tact and seeing that there was no one else doing anything like it. And I actually had the chance to meet Dr. Temple Grandin and, um, said, Hey, I've got this idea. What do you think? And she was a hundred percent the catalyst where she was like, you need to put down your guitar, stop doing this, stop what you're doing and go do this right now. And for whatever reason, um, you know, I don't know if I just had too much coffee that day or just my heart or my mind, whatever in that place, it was just like, okay. And did, and uh, it's been the best advice. She's since become just a dear friend and uh, she'll call me sometimes out of the blue. I was just on Colorado public radio and, um, all of a sudden she heard that apparently as she was leaving a factory and somewhere she was consulting on and I don't even know where Colorado. And she called me from the parking garage. It's like, I just heard you. Thank you. You did it right. And she's just so sweet and encouraging and just we're in alignment in so many things. And it just makes me happy that she still takes the time to, to call and say that she's keeping up with everything. So, um, yeah, that was a, a game changer and, um, you know, it's grown a lot since then. And, the world's grown a lot since then. So it's kind of exciting to see, you know, we're seven years in as of next month. And it's wild to think that, you know, where we are seven years in, it seems like others are starting to get to a similar place and where we're going to be in another seven, another decade, another 20 years. I don't know, but I have a feeling it's heading in a direction that it just finally start heading, you know, what it feels like. Or Okay, there's so much, Danny, now I need to unpack here. First, just to be clear, this is the Dr. Temple Grandin from Colorado State University, uh, ag professor, autist, she's on yourself, and she yeah. told you directly, you've got to put out your guitar and go start this. And when Temple tells you to do something, you do it, because she's usually right. I think so. Um, yeah, she's an amazing individual. She's like, uh, you know, Women's Hall of Fame, Time Magazine, 100 Women's Most Influential People. She has a new book that she wrote. She's an extraordinary person. She really is. Wow. Well, so then, and I heard you describe Dylan a little bit there. Did Dylan get the tinkerer, um, sort of woodworker genes? Or is that Ellie? Or I was how, so uh... hope so, my friend. <laughs> no. <laughs> Definitely the tinkerer, but it seems like, you know, this entire, uh, and I hate the stereotype and I'm not trying to, but it seems like the Gen Zers are definitely more technology based and Dylan definitely falls in line with that. But I can definitely get him thinking outside the box in regards to even what that looks like technologically. And, you know, the neat things we do at TACT is we look at it from a holistic approach of not just using, but diagnosing, fixing, and assembling, because there's so much more to it than just using these technologies, but genuinely understanding them and able to fix them and maintain them and create the infrastructure to sustain them. I think is going to be important. So I'm hoping that in taking that, you know, the tech stuff that we're doing now at, at TACT, we're we work with Microsoft now with their um, HoloLens doing mixed reality, augmented reality stuff for some of the EV car stuff can hopefully be like a unique blend behind his tech, you know, enjoyment and hands-on 
tinkering. So it doesn't have a carburetor, but it's okay. So the first <laughs> carburetor, who knows what a carburetor is these days, right? Huh? The next generation. It, so here's one of the things that you said earlier that so resonated with me is I believe this is not about like changing those with autism. Yes, we have to support them every way that we can. It's about creating a world that's more autism ready, right? And more autism friendly and meeting autistics where they are. But can you, do you have stats or tell me about this extraordinary need for adults and whether it's around underemployment or unemployment, um, yeah. I don't know, did that factor in it all to, you know, to how you thought about the change you wanted to make? You know, it, it did to a degree at a time, but I feel like he was so young and I was so young, even though it registered and it was definitely one of the founding pillars of what we wanted to do with TACT. It definitely registers more now as the older he's getting it. It makes it feel that much more tangible and real in the impact we're having. Um, and it's definitely become more in focus as we fine tuned it and gotten um, better at it, honestly, as far as creating career opportunities for individuals and that kind of a quality of opportunity. But when he was younger, you know, you would read stats and they haven't changed. You know, that's the saddest thing. There's an office of employment here in Colorado that's doing some great stuff. And I remember going to one of their meetings and hearing this was around the 30th anniversary of ADA. So it's since been a couple of years past that now and talking about how, you know, there is accessibility more so in a lot of buildings, except for like our capital um, and some other buildings like that, that, you know, help and accommodators and support enablers in a variety of different circumstances. ADA has been great with that, but employment hasn't changed. And so it's like all of these initiatives and all of these programs and all of these steps that we've taken for inclusivity haven't really changed the landscape of what that looks like for the neurodivergent individuals. And that's wild to think that that's still behind, even the, from the fact of when he was, you know, a child, when he was first diagnosed and where we've started. So attacked, we have an 83% placement rate, it's actually 83.3 to be exact, but um, we have a pretty good run as far as getting individuals placed um, into careers and hopefully we can keep that going. But if we can, even change the landscape five degrees, that'll be more than it's been achieved in decades. And it, it's about freaking time <laughs> that starts taking place. I want to dig in some more on the specific coaching and extraordinary job training programs and placements that you do, but like, why has this need not yet been addressed if you were to pinpoint? That's such a great question. You know, it's something that we ask ourselves all the time. I know I, I read so much, you know, as a former musician in my past life, it's a similar conundrum in the sense of like, you look at every study that ever comes out ever about music education, and it will tell you, it makes you smarter, it increases X, Y, and Z for like your future of life. People that study music are more successful, all these different things. And yet the arts are constantly the first thing that programs cut. It makes no sense. I think of it in a similar way of autism employment and neurodivergent education and inclusivity and job, where it's still something for whatever reason people are afraid of. And they hear that word autism and they just either have some perception in their mind of what that looks like, um, right or wrong, um, or they just are ignorant to it. Or there was a study that just came out from the Global Disability Association and they had this thing saying the average accommodation costs less than $500 for the employer to make a change. 500 bucks for the average. And it's like for, you know, our community, a lot of times it could be more, it could be less. Let's just stick with the 500. But I know we work with a lot with electricians, for example. We get a lot of great companies that hire our graduates, Wayfield, Sturgeon, Rexel, these great companies that hire our graduates. And talking to a friend that runs Wayfield, he would tell me about a buddy of his that is inspired by what Wayfield's doing. Didn't hire a tax grad, which is totally okay, but did embrace hiring neurodiverse individuals. And this person is so proficient, they've re done the work of four other neurotypicals because they're that good at their job. And it's such an incredible story where they then went back to him and like, man, your company's onto it because this makes so much more sense. But it's taking people that have that experience from, I think, a business perspective that are showcasing how it's making their entire culture better and not from this programmatic, oh, look, I'm clicking a DEI um, box over here on the corner, but genuinely embracing a culture of inclusivity to actually bring our community and all of our people together. Um, they're finally starting to get it, but we just need more 
stories about that. And we need those people to be more vocal and showcase it and not try to just hide it away and tuck it in the corner, you know? That's kind of how it feels now. What's crazy, I, I mean, to your point, this isn't just checking a DEI box and, um, and doing the, the quote unquote right thing. This makes economic and financial sense. I mean, one electrician, it sounds like, um, neurodivergent electrician did the work of four neurotypical. And tell me, tell me more about what um, tax job coaching and training looks like specifically, like help paint a picture of that. And then I can love to share, share more stories around the successes, individual successes and cool. getting placed. Well, thanks. We do it a little bit differently um, in the sense that, you know, we work with the employers directly to see what's real and what they're actually looking for. We don't want it to have this academic, you know, off to the side approach where it's like, we think we know what employers want, but we don't actually know what employers want. So, um, we talk to the employers directly to figure out what's authentic and what's real. And then as a small nonprofit, we serve a couple hundred kids every year or young adults every year, but we never have more than six students per class. We've set it up where we have a trade professional and an autism professional using an RBT, a BCBA, a CODA, somebody with autism experience that's also there working with that trade professional. And they're working together to make that training as authentic as possible towards the job. And when they do that, we're creating what we call a simulation site where the students are able to simulate what it's like working for an employer, a variety of different capacities, doing the same jobs. And so they're getting the sounds, the sensations, the tooling, the language, the vocabulary, all of those things at first. And then when we get them going towards a job, then we do work-based interviews and portfolios and kind of on-the-job training for that job. And then we have a job coach that's, you know, one-on-one -on -one, in person, side-by-side -side with them, which is great. As opposed to a lot of people will use, you know, Zoom calls. And if that's all you have, it's better than nothing. But we try to do things in person because there's a lot more that's achieved when it's something in person. And then it's kind of like a step, right? Where they've learned this skill, they've learned this trade, then they've stepped into working with the employer. They still have that tact person that's there working with them. And then that tact person kind of slowly fades out as they're working at just that employer. That's really simplifying it, but to kind of put it in like a linear graph, if that's even possible, just to showcase some of the steps. And then we do things like help them get tools because a lot of trades, men and women, you know, have to have their own tools. And we wanna find partners that are A, giving good wages. The average tax graduate has a $19.86 starting salary. We're finding partners that you know, embrace advancement and not just looking at you know, a position, but what is the longevity and lifespan of somebody working in that trade look like for the future? So they have a whole career and uh, knock on wood, there's, there's always learning and growth. We're able to individualize a lot, which I think has helped to the success of it. Um, so yeah, it's getting closer, getting closer, still way to go, but we're getting closer for sure. So you described electricians. What are some examples of the other trades that you're commonly placing your, your graduates in? Yeah. We do a lot with auto mechanics. That's one of the things I think a lot of people think of with TACT because we started in a 58 Chevy because as you mentioned my bio, I love classic cars because they're so freaking cool. Just so much more style. So, you know, a lot with cars, we work with Toyota, um, which we became the first program that Toyota sponsored that works with neurodivergent individuals and they can actually get Toyota certified um, and get all of the certs that they need to actually then step into a job with a Toyota dealership. So then we have Toyota dealerships that we partner with too. So it's neat to have that alignment and kind of progression with both Toyota National and then also with the local dealerships so that the training that we're doing is pretty neat. So a lot in the auto mechanics, we work with a bunch of different car dealerships here throughout the Denver area, as well as groups like Advanced Auto Parts and Jiffy Loops. Gosh, we've got so many. There's 38 of our active business partners right now. So we're just starting with Excel, which we're super excited about. The neurodiversity at works, people that are, you know, coming here to start working. Also in, in Colorado, I've set up some neat things that we haven't got placed yet, but in power, which we're looking forward to that. There's 38 businesses that we personally work with. Everything from the Denver airport, which is pretty cool. Some of the things that they've done there as well. Um, a lot of electrical companies, as you've mentioned, also things like Southwest installers doing um, welding type work, which we're pretty happy about as well. Um, so bunch of different stuff, kind of all over the spectrum, if you will, bad pun of uh, employers. Where my mind keeps coming back to, Danny, is like, what's it going to take to expand tact to the 
entire country, if not the world. And to get specific on this, what is the, the biggest barrier to scaling? Is it needing to build these partnerships, given the intention you place into bringing companies into the fold? Is it finding enough individuals to work with? Is it finding the coaches? That's a great question. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. There, there's a couple really big barriers that we at least have identified so far, but we don't even know what we don't know as we're trying to go national. And we're aware of that. But the ones that we're aware of at this point is first and foremost, you know, as a dad of a child with autism, we've set it up that if people want to come to us, we work with all kinds of foundations, grantors, um, community-centered boards to create scholarships and opportunities for advice to come. We don't want it to ever be this fee for service where parents have done well so they can bring their child to our program or for this individual themselves to bring somebody. We want it to be genuinely attainable for all individuals to come. And so that in itself is difficult where all across the country, autism services are funded differently. So how do you create those pathways all across the country? There is no universal design in that sense or attainability or accessibility for autism services. Um, so that's one of the barriers that we've made. If it was just fee for service, like a for-profit or a nonprofit that is, you know, a school that's just like, this is our tuition go, that would be easier, but it wouldn't be as accessible. So we try to avoid that. The second one is, you know, part of the success, like you mentioned, is having those employers that want to jump in. And so getting those business partners in different states or different cities, gosh, that's hard too. That's a really hard thing to do too. So um, those are two of the ones that we've identified that are the biggest ones. And then there's, you know, things that are equally important, but also difficult. As a 501c3, you have to set up separate board of directors and then the board of directors can oversee their board of directors and there becomes all kinds of, you know, mundane things that can become tricky that are also equally important, but, you know, board of directors, for example, they're volunteers. They're giving us their time. We don't want to tax them with, okay, I need you to look over the branch in Texas and the one in North Carolina and the one in Idaho, you know, or, or whatever. So those are the ones that we're struggling with, honestly. Um, so we'll see. We're trying to figure out how to overcome that for sure. Well, tell me more about what it takes to bring an employer on. So if you've got like a Toyota that's already inspired to want to do this, how much training and shaping of their behavior and their program do you have to do to get them ready to accept tech graduates? That's a great question too. You're asking good ones. Ironically, not very much. That's one of the amazing things. I think within the trades, one of the perks of the trades is language, for example, autism and communication, when you, when you look at how those two correlate together, right? Um, also within the trades, English as a second language has already been embraced in a variety of different ways. So all of the language barriers that could perhaps be difficult in like an IT setting, for example, have already been overcome in a lot of skilled trades organizations because a lot of, let's say you're an electrician, well, let's just say you're an auto mechanic, everything is laid out in diagrams, color-coded, A, B, C, D, and it's broken down sequential. I mean, it's a task analysis already created for you. And um, they've already looked at it from that perspective. So for a lot of times for them, it's like they'll bring us their diagrams or what their scope of work that they're trying to do. And we don't even have to modify it. It's just like, oh, great. All right, thanks. This is our lesson plan for the day. Here you go, kids. Because I mean, they're already there in, in that regards. Now, getting them to embrace a variety of different things could be a little bit more tricky, but in that regard, the scope of work of the actual trade, not so much. So for a lot of it, though, it's helping them to also then communicate with their staff because sometimes there still is, you know, some unjust um, biases that exist within their own community culture that they're either then working on themselves or trying to address and then creating that culture, at least at first, but TAC just had her open house this past Friday. And one of my favorite parts about it was one of our graduates that working at a local car dealership, his boss came, a bunch of his coworkers came. There was like half a dozen individuals from his company that came to the open house where he's brought so much value to the company, just being himself, like who he is, which is an incredible person. And he's very talented that the company sees that and they've rallied behind it and made it part of their culture. So it was so cool 
to see his coworkers coming to our open house and being like, I love what you guys are doing. You know, this individual has been a great addition. We need more and, you know, going from there. So little things like that are the wins that keep you going, you know. I, that's pretty extraordinary that you're creating culture change in helping companies to become part of this more autism ready world. That feels so powerful. But, yeah. You know, the other, I want to come back to like economic reality here. I mean, as I understand, they correct me if I'm wrong, but there's a shortage of skilled trades people. And mm -hmm. on the other hand, I mean, some of the stats I've seen are neurodivergent individuals are up to like 80% underemployed. So doesn't this seem like if my data is correct, <laughs> gut check me, it doesn't seem like a no brainer. It, for every five skilled tradesmen that leave the trade and retire, only two enter the field. So like Colorado, for example, for every opening, there's two individuals ready to fill it. So in the skilled trades, especially like we need people and not just people, we need to change the stigma. I mean, still, you know, I went to college, I have a master's degree, yay. And I'm glad I did. It was, it was great, but we have to put forward the notion that skilled trades have value and it's not this lesser than profession. In fact, a lot of times these individuals make a heck of a lot more than their quote blue collar counterparts, if you will. But people don't realize that because of the stigma that's around it. And it's like, do you want to go do landscaping and make six figures doing landscaping and have control of your schedule? Or do you want to go work in an office and start fetching coffee and work your way up and, you know, be at a college making 20, 30,000? When you look at like the average starting salary too of somebody leaving college versus somebody just entering the trades, you know, um, electricians a few years in, they're already pulling in 80K a year. Do you want to be a 22 year old making 80K starting? Or do you want to be a 22 year old that just graduated with a quarter million dollars in debt? And you're hoping that's going to pay off. It, either is fine. I mean, you, you choose what you want to choose. It's free world, you know, go for it. Yeah. Uh, you know, helping individuals know, anybody know that that is an opportunity that exists that may not have been presented to them. That kind of stigma is an entirely separate podcast, but this idea, 80K after three years with no debt compared to like unemployed and like extraordinary debt. Exactly. And it's, it's just, it's so interesting to me when people see that that's a possibility that they aren't aware of. I mean, um, it's, it's a very real, it's very, very doable. And it's like, you know, the cool thing seeing our community be starting to be embraced in it with the business partners that we have that have done it. Um, they're realizing it. And then that's a whole other topic too, is changing the culture around if they're making a certain amount of money, then they lose their benefits and SSI becomes a whole other issue and benefits counseling. And that could be a whole other discussion because so many families, at least that we work with that are now getting stepped into careers, have to have those conversations and understanding what that looks like. Um, so, um, yeah, that's a whole other topic, my friend, and changing the dichotomy of what that looks like. So. Yeah, totally. You know what I've always said about that? I've literally never understood why employers are responsible for uh, health insurance and why there isn't some other function. And I say, look, if employers are responsible for health insurance, I totally get that. But then employers should also be responsible for car insurance and for all these other things. And, um, you know, uh, in spoiler alert, I don't know, I think there's a lot to be said for a single payer system, but I'm going to get into that topic now. But, you know, yeah. why employers do that? It's sidebar conversation. So that started during the Great Depression. You know, FDR had put a wage freeze where you couldn't make any more money than you were already making. Um, so everybody was stuck, right, as far as what they were pulling in. And there was no room for advancement in the country. Everybody was frozen. And so the loophole in the law was that organizations could pay for your health benefits. And if you no longer had to pay for your health benefits, all of a sudden it was a raise, right? Because... Health insurance costs companies so much money. And so everybody then, all the companies started being like, I can't pay you more than your current salary due to the law, but I could pay for your health insurance and you'll be making that much more money. And so everybody flipped to that. Um, and it's never flipped back. But um, yeah, that was FDR. So thanks, Great Depression. <laughs> Dude, you just learned me something new. I mean, it's traumatic having to like, Every time you move an employer and look, these days, most people are moving employers every couple few years. Right. And you've got oh, to go absolutely. find new insurance. Like that's just that, that just seems like not the kind of society we want for ourselves. And autism parents, that's a, 
that's a heavy burden. That's a heavy lift, man. So um, for sure, that's definitely something that weighs on people for finding gigs, for sure. Mm. Well, you know, I know the journey of, um, of entrepreneurs, of business builders is not always bright and rosy. So Danny, what's been the most challenging part of your tech journey so far? Wow, we should have, this would be one we have over many beers, my friend, because there are so many, uh, so many different things. But getting tech set up was tricky in the sense that it's such a different approach from a lot of traditional autism uh, groups that are all doing amazing things, not to put anybody down. But uh, we heard no, gosh, more times than I can tell you. I know insurance, we were turned down 13 times, but so many partner groups would even come to us and be like, they would just flatly to say, our kids can't do this, which I think is just bluntly wrong uh, personally. And I think tact has proven that, but it's taken years for us to actually showcase within our own community the capability of our kids and what the potential that can be realized when set up for the correct opportunity for success and recognizing that talent and strength do exist and how do we set them up for success rather than a future that's less than they deserve. Um, businesses, ironically, has not been one of the, the hardest part. Getting businesses to jump on board, knock on wood, um, has been something that's been working out creating scholarships and opportunities for people, that's been really tricky too. I and mean, it's taken time. It's taken a lot of years to get all of these foundations and groups to jump on board. And, and rightfully so. I mean, they're supporting us with their resources and we want to be good stewards of that. And, you know, as a nonprofit, we are voluntarily audited every year. We have all of our financials online. Like we want to be good stewards and showcase that the support that people give us, we're using those resources in a way that serves the community. Um, but, you know, getting people on board to do those things, that, that's hard. And COVID happened in 2020, right? And like we had to do a complete pivot, but kept it going. And during that time period, for example, we turned into, you know, like a manufacturing facility since so that we had our teachers manufacturing kits and we sold thousands and thousands of kits of things that we were then shipping to schools and parents at home to like keep making stuff, but like keeping people working and, you know, keeping the mission and the vision moving forward during odd economic times. That's been really hard. That's been really, really hard. And then finding great staff. We have an amazing staff attacked. That's been incredible. Um, they work really hard. They're incredible humans doing amazing things, but trying to get them to where they need to be paid successfully too. I mean, one of the great ironies is our graduates are making more money than our staff. And like, that's, you know, kind of the nature of nonprofits, but also not ac acceptable in a lot of ways. We need to be able to pay our staff the same. And that, you know, view of what is accessible and appropriate within nonprofits too, um, you know, they're creating futures. They need to be taken care of and rewarded for the success that they're creating for our community. And a lot of grants and rightfully so, again, like we're open book. If anybody wants to look up TAC, like all means do, we, we're, we're available, you can check it out. But a lot of grants are, have that 80-20 rule where it's like 80% goes towards programming, 20% towards admin, get it. You know, some grantors sometimes don't look at having a building as programmatic. They look at that admin and it's like, I can't have a program without a building, but a lot of them are amazing. And as things are evolving in our community to be more embraced, we have amazing partners and amazing grantors that support us. So if any of them are watching, I hope they know how much they're appreciated, but, um, getting to this point has just, it's taken a lot of time and my hair looks brown in this, but it, Jesus, it was really brown before we started this. It's gotten a lot grayer because it takes a lot. There's been many times where the board of directors will come to me, you know, for a few years, my average work hours have been about 107, 110 hours per week. Um, it's too much and it shouldn't be that, but it's what's necessary to get the mission forward. So in the future, I'm hoping that we can build it where, you know, Danny doesn't have to keep working those kind of hours. That would be nice. So. That, that feels like unsustainable. You struck a nerve. So I was in the nonprofit world for seven plus years. I started an outdoor education nonprofit in, um, in, in Reno, Nevada, the Lake Tahoe area. And it's going phenomenally um, to this day. But this idea of an arbitrary cap on the percentage of admin hours never made sense to me. And here's why. I always ask the question, tell me how that gives you insight into how we are best fulfilling our mission. Shouldn't the outcome yeah. be like how well you're serving to your mission as opposed to some arbitrary admin percentage? 
Yo, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, there was a great book. Um, Dan, I forget his last name right now, but I'm sure it will come to me after he finished the podcast, but he wrote a book called Uncharitable. And it was a fantastic book. I don't know if you've ever seen his TED talk either, but he was talking about just that, where it's like the nonprofit sector makes up roughly $5 billion throughout the country, but we're tasked with solving the most, you know, health crimes, homelessness, unemployment. Why? You know what I mean? And like, how do we attract the same talent? You know, if somebody can, a talented individual can make the same money in a nonprofit versus a for-profit, they might choose to come to a nonprofit and have a bigger impact. But a lot of times there's just the reality of economics where that talented person has to choose a for-profit to take care of their family. And the nonprofit world and then our humanity and culture suffers from that, that that's unnecessary. So how do we create that equality where, you know, no matter what field, those people that are working to make change can also then be recognized for it and have the same level of success and same level of support they have for their families. Um, that could be a whole other conversation or podcast too, because I think that's a, an interesting thing. So um, that's been a challenge for us for sure. Well, the other thing that struck me, you know, I'm very fond of saying, Danny, that as an entrepreneur who's, you know, put a business plan together and is out, whether you're trying to raise money, just get it started. Like you almost have to be a little bit crazy because you're trying to convince people of a need that's out there that hasn't been yeah. met. And the only way you can meet that need is through this organization that doesn't yet exist. But it's one thing to be an entrepreneur, say in healthcare, right? As an ABA provider or whatever to start it, like a, you know, a, a car dealership, there's an analog that our communities and funders and investors have for, for those businesses. There is no analog though, right? For tech that made yeah. it, it sounds like that much harder. No, it, it made it exceedingly hard. And even like in the nonprofit world, we just renovated our new space, which is, is amazing. And all our business partners jumped up and helped us. If we went to the bank and said, hey, can we get a loan to renovate our space? The answer would be no, because we are a nonprofit and you have to either then have you know, some individual that has a lot of finances that would back it up entirely at like, you know, almost a three to one type ratio. So one point million dollar renovation. Okay, great. Find me somebody with four million in liquidity, say to the bank, and yes, I'll you know loan you to help the nonprofit. But even that is looked at completely differently, and it's you know I feel bad for the bank. I mean, it's just, they're put in a losing situation too, in, in that regards, which is a weird thing to say about banks, maybe. But everybody is set up for not winning in that regards until we can get past some of these regulatory things that are holding us down. Um, we can we can do so much more. We could do so so much more, and I think. You know, TAP is already doing a lot. And as we move forward, one of the things that I'm optimistic in is that we're starting to create this movement that people are paying attention to and people are paying attention and they're more willing to actually, you know, pivot a little bit or, you know, open the door a little bit wider. And if we can then show how successful we can do with that, then it keeps going. And so, um, you know, we're headed in a good direction where it is now versus where it was seven years ago very different. So. Well, Danny, what's one thing every ABA business owner should start doing and one thing to stop doing? I think every ABA business should start looking at programs like TACT and partnering with them. You know, we partner with a lot of great ABA groups and I think working together and not looking at the things we're doing as scary, but recognizing that it works in concert with what you're already doing. And, you know, there's so many perks and benefits to working together, I think that would be something that would be really beneficial to do. I think there's a lot still that don't approach organizations like TAC that would be something that they could start doing that could really have a big impact. Um, you know, one Revel comes to mind, they're an ABA group that's been sending students to TAC, to Firefly, um, they're, they're amazing. By working together, we're able to create some pretty unique outcomes, I think. So that was what they should start doing. What should they stop doing? Um, that, that's a whole other thing. I think I have double-edged sword in that, in the sense that I have it from a dad perspective. And I think, um, I also have it from the tact perspective. And I think ABA looked at with the right light and headed in the right direction. You know, they have some barriers and some traditions and some things they're going to have to overcome, not from anything that they're doing wrong, but just some things that have been done in the past. So I think if they are at least cognitive of those and try to change that, I think that would be beneficial. 
because awareness and acceptance of those things and acknowledgement of them rather than pretending that they didn't take place um, would be good. So I think there's a lot of really good uh, BCBAs out there doing super cool stuff um, that are they themselves held back by the stereotype and stigma of what behavioralism looks like. So I think just acknowledging it moving forward and then partnering with groups like TACT would be um, a beneficial course towards moving towards the future for sure. Right on. Well, Danny, where can people find you and TACT online? So our website is buildwithtact.org. I think that would be a great start. Um, we're also on LinkedIn, Facebook, you know, all those fun things. I don't do the Instagram, but I hear we're on that too. <laughs> so <laughs> that would be a good one to check out as well. I know. And you have built out a new center, as I understand it, in Englewood, Colorado, in the Denver metro area. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. We have this new, it's just over 18,474 square feet. And, you know, the amazing thing that you know, the town of Englewood has jumped on board and, and recommending tact to all the businesses there. So as far as the community all coming together, I think that's a great example of that. So I hope people could check us out. Right on. And full disclosure to listeners. So Danny, um, who is based in the Denver metro area, actually lives like right up the mountain from me on Lookout Mountain. I live in Golden. So I think, Danny, you have a distinction of you are the closest <laughs> person that I've ever interviewed. So um, I, I have not yet seen the center um, and I wait to do so. Well, great minds think alike, my friend. So we, we picked the same place to live. So yeah. <laughs> Bingo. All right. Are you ready for the uh, hot take rapid fire questions? Sure. Go for it. All right, Danny, you're on your deathbed. What's the one thing you want to be remembered for? That I think that I lived as authentically as possible, that I genuinely tried and was present and tried to be a decent human. What's your most important self-care practice? Playing guitar and working on cars. I have to turn a wrench fan. I have <laughs> That's so good to know that those things, I mean, they were like careers or at least a guitar play, but it can still be a passion after it's a career. Is that right? Oh, absolutely. The, the sound of a vintage Martin guitar. That's, that's heaven for sure. Absolutely. What's your favorite song and or music genre? You know, I don't have a favorite song. That would be terrible to say, but music genre. I grew up in the Appalachian Mountains in the Blue Ridge. Bluegrass is um, folk music, Americana. That's my home, man. That's the jam for sure. Oh, man, brother, you know which band um, uh, my wife and I have seen more than any other live show? Yonder Mountain String Band. Actually up from uh, well, Boulder Note. Yeah, they are. They definitely are. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. We love us some bluegrass. Yeah. Do, do you have a Yonder Mountain story to share? No, I was going to say there's a band called Watch House that used to be Mandolin Orange years ago, North Carolina band. Same kind of thing, but it's like when you grow up with it locally, yeah, you, uh, you stick with that for sure. Definitely. Uh, I love it. One of our favorites too. What's one thing you'd tell your 18-year-old self, Danny? It sounds weird. Maybe this is just my mood at the, at the time, but I used to believe and I think when I was younger that the harder you worked, that that was going to be it. And I think that's important for sure. But I think relationships are even that much more important. I think surrounding yourself with good people and having relationships with those good people because, man, do you need those people in your life? And I think um, I credit those around me that have supported me and seen me and picked me up. And, you know, especially when I'm down or even held me accountable when I'm high um, to know that, you know, what's important. So the friendships, relationships, that's got to be the thing that carries you. Mm, beautifully said. Well, if you could only wear one style of footwear for the rest of your life, what would it be? <laughs> so everybody gives me crap. I don't, I don't wear socks, except when I'm doing military stuff, I have to wear socks, but I'm a Birkenstock guy. I grew up in Asheville, North Carolina. So I still have my Birkenstock <laughs> and new balance. <laughs> Those would be it. Yeah. Dude, yeah. there were very few days that went by in the early mid nineties when I was not in my pair of Birkenstocks. Oh, hell yeah. I love that they're coming back too, but some of us never faded away. So, <laughs> right. Like history is all about those cycles. Danny, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for all you're doing for our community and for neurodivergent individuals. I appreciate you. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. It's always a pleasure. 
Hey, kind listener. Thanks for tuning in. If you like this episode, can you do me a favor? Give me a rating on your favorite podcast channel. It helps more values line people like you find the pod. Till next time, peace. So expensive. Mm, I don't know why. Inflation. <laughs> <laughs>